Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, panel on uh, mainstreaming psychedelics. We all know and witness that uh, we are in the psychedelic renaissance. Um, clinics are opening, there is an online dissemination of a lot of esoteric and psychedelic knowledge. Um, there are all kinds of books, many books are, are appearing, a lot of academic uh, work is appearing, and all this also leads to uh, a mainstreaming of uh, psychedelics. And this panel is really uh, meant to, uh, to investigate what are the gains uh, and what are the losses, what are the benefits and uh, what are maybe the potential pitfalls that uh, we, um, we should look out for. We have a great uh, uh, panel participants, uh, Eric Davis, Ronan Levy, and Nishé uh, Devnot. Um, and I will introduce each of the speakers first um, and uh, after which they have a sort of five minute uh, uh, statement uh, to open up and kick off our, our, our dialogues. So um, without further ado, uh, I will first uh, introduce uh, Eric Davis. Um, who actually doesn't need any introduction. Um, his uh, books, many books are uh, classics. Um, the cult classic Technosis, Myth, Magic and Mysticism uh, in the Information Age is a cult classic. And his new book, High Weirdness, uh, Drugs, Esoterica and Visionary Experiences in the 70s is on its way to become one. And Eric also has a, a wonderful uh, blog and website, The Burning Shore. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with his uh, work, but I'm very happy you're here, uh, Eric, and uh, the floor is yours for your uh, opening statement. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks for uh, everyone for, for being here. I mean, it's, this has been a great conference. I got to spend all, 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 not all morning because it's the West Coast, so I wasn't willing to get up that early, but it's been uh, quite a, a delightful gathering of of minds and, and mixtures of different perspectives. And I guess that's sort of where I, I wanted to start out is that if we say that one of the main things that's happening right now with the psychedelic renaissance is the transformation of psychedelics into Western medicines, then we have to acknowledge right off the bat that there's something very unusual about these medicines. We all know about set and setting, and we can talk about set and setting in different ways, but it certainly uh, leads us into a situation where the stories we have about what these compounds are directly feed back into the experiences themselves in a way that's not the case for other uh, drugs and uh, medical operations and, and moves that have been used to treat the mental health crisis. You, know, you can go back in time and we can see the way that narratives shape things like lobotomy or electroshock therapy or Milltown, all of which we now have very different narratives about than when they first hit the uh, psychiatric scene. Um, and things are much more amplified with the set and setting feedback mechanism that is, that is part of psychedelic experience. One little example of that is just, uh, I remember talking to a, a prominent researcher and I asked them about, well, what, what playlist do you use for your, for your research? And he was like, well, you know, we kind of do a modified version of the playlist that we got from Johns Hopkins, which is a very specific kind of musical playlist with classical music, et cetera, et cetera. And anyone who has any experience with these things knows how dramatically different things can become with the right or wrong track. And so my conversation was sort of about, well, don't you see the way your, your thumb is already on the scale with your playlist? But there's no other option. It's not like you can not have the playlist because that too is going to make a difference. Obviously, playlists can be very helpful if you want positive outcomes. But do you make a do you include a satanic heavy metal track just to you know kind of include the dark side of the force in, into the mix or do you you keep things on the nice and balanced well these are decisions they're they're programming decisions and they directly impact what's going on i don't think psychedelics are all about set and setting by any means there are some inherent universal characteristics to them and i think one of the most difficult and marvelous challenges we have right now is to determine those is to really come into uh, to intimacy with what things we can kind of rely on. I think that systemic or ecological thinking uh, is one of those things. My hunch is that it leads to a larger systemic view of, of self and relationship to nature and time and history and biology and the cosmos itself. 
And I want to stay with this model of ecology because one of the things we're going to, we're witnessing with mainstreaming is just the rise of multiple narratives of psychedelics. And by narratives, I don't just mean a, a story or even a language like this is a medicine or an ally or a plant or a drug. These are already stories in, inherent in the language, but they also tell a certain, they also frame the user or the consumer or the patient in a certain way as well. And so right now we're seeing multiple narratives and there've been multiple narratives for a long time. Now, one, the way I like to think about it is we are, we're in a great ecology of narratives where there's multiple narratives and they're interacting and contradicting and passing each other by, ignoring each other. But the question that I have with mainstreaming psycho, uh, psychedelics is whether or not there's a monopolistic move in this ecology. And when I first started to really track the way that mainstream expertise was transforming psychedelic discourse, I, I had a much, I had a, a lot of really negative reactions. Um, and part of that reason is just that personally, I have been a largely independent scholar and writer. I have a PhD, but I'm not in the academy. And for 25 years, I've been writing about psychedelics and per actively participating in the discourse in conferences that many of which were very underground. So I'm, I'm very deeply in, uh, informed by underground values. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. So a lot of the new stuff was coming like, oh my God, is this an existential threat or not? And it's kind of an open question to me. Is it an existential threat or not? And I think that's one of the main uh, questions we have is whether the sort of monopolistic character of capitalism, or at least its tendency, uh, ends up uh, producing something similar in this realm of discourses. To say a little bit more about this sort of the, the underground values that I come from is that it was a very interdisciplinary scene. Uh, there was a lot of crosstalk between very different perspectives, and it wasn't filtered through any kind of professionalism or expertise or really access to major cash. It was a market world. It's not about markets are bad, but the specific mechanisms of capitalism really stayed away with the exception of some cultural events, you know, obviously festival scenes and things, they have some relationship to, to you know, capitalism as a kind of consumer capitalism as a, as a feature. It's not like this was a, a world apart, uh, but it did provide a very interesting uh, counter narrative to uh, mainstream uh, capitalism but it also provided a different model of science. So here's a question for all of you, and I want uh, researchers and wherever you are, when psychedelics were scheduled, you know, in the late 60s, early 1970s, on a global level, uh, ultimately in the 60s, did science stop? Did science stop until the psychedelic renaissance, maybe starting with uh, Rick Strassman's DMT studies, but definitely with Johns Hopkins and, uh, you know, 15 or so years ago? Or did it continue? And if it continued, if research continued, real research, real science, well, what do we do with those kinds of knowledges and the kind of culture that was specific to those kinds of knowledges? And I was just on a great panel about internet subcult drug subcultures, and Yanni talked about the, the, the Reddit scene. And the Reddit scene was, is, was very much my world, a kind of psychonautical, self-informed, science-heavy, practice conscious, responsible approach to these things that's very different in some ways than the kinds of expertise that scientists are now giving us as part of this mainstreaming, where they're representing a kind of a professionalized body who understand how to create these experiences for other people who speak directly for the sciences, some of which are involved in these capitalist enterprises. So it's a very different shift and so think about that, like what, what's the value of, of science in, in, you know, in all this? And so while I was initially kind of quite reactive uh, about a lot of the things that I saw happening, I'm trying to have this larger ecological view where I recognize that there will be multiple narratives, that multiple narratives are good for everybody because we do want more people experiencing these things and their obvious healing capacities. And so it's, it's also good to kind of step back and allow that to be open or if you you think about it in terms of, of the mushroom. It's a great thing. So that's probably my little final story as a kind of model of where we're at. So in terms of in terms of monopolistic thinking, in terms of multiple subcultures. So the mushroom, right? 
we have Compass come out and try to patent a uh, production, you know, a way of synthesizing psilocybin. They have to do it a couple of times because they make these outlandish claims that are based on previous knowledge that is part of this open science, citizen science world of underground psychedelic research that I'm familiar with. Uh, and so they, they go for it, they go for it, they finally are able to prove one element to get themselves the patent. So that's a monopolistic procedure. Patents are monopolistic gestures because even if that allows other uh, uh, companies to come up with their own routes of synthesis, it's, it tends to shy away investors. And we have to remember that the, ma the mainstreaming narrative of psychedelics as healing uh, agents uh, is, is not just a narrative for the people who might be taking these, it's a narrative for investors. And that's a particular kind of narrative that I think we should all be paying very close attention to. But then you know, almost like the Jedi's, USANA comes in and says, hey, actually, guys, there's another way to synthesize this stuff. And here you go, public domain. It's like, strike one against right. the empire. I want to interrupt you now. <laughs> Let me I just finish also, my line. <laughs> we will come back more. to all this. <laughs> Okay. But I also want, I want to also uh, uh, listen to Neshe and, and Ronan, sure, and sure. then I'm sure we will pick up uh, these questions because they are very important questions uh, and you have been raising now so many uh, important issues. Uh, but I would uh, now ask, actually ask uh, Neshe to, uh, um, but I will introduce her first, uh, of, of, of course. Neshe Devnot is uh, the Medicine Society and Culture Editor at uh, Symposia. And her research explores the function of metaphor and other literary devices to describe psychedelic experiences. And I think she's now working on a, an interesting looking project called uh, Chemical uh, Poetics. Uh, so, Nishi. Great, thanks. I, I'm uh, on side with Eric on a lot of what was just stated. This was clear to me. I've been working in the field for 10 years. My first Horizons conference, uh, Eric stood up and said, you know, all of this is really interesting data, but we knew all of this before. Like, where is the, where is the interesting work being done? And that was early on a signal to me that there was the scope to not just do the biomedical game, which is important. I've unquestionably benefited materially from the mainstreaming of psychedelics in the sense that I had this prestigious postdoc in the bioethics department at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, which is a very prominent medical school. Um, at the same time, I, like my colleague at Symposia, David Nichols, um, we're drawn, we were both drawn to psychedelics and many of us were um, from being disenfranchised from the mainstream and, and finding people who got it. And many of us at Symposia are either autistic or otherwise neurodivergent, not neurotypical. And psychedelics for many of us have been a way of understanding our minds and our differences in a way that has been extremely empowering, but doesn't fit with the current um, medical and corporate, especially approach to things. Um, and much of our work at Symposia, I felt a little bit, Eric, uh, thrown under the bus by your recent newsletter where you said, oh, the interesting people are dying and, you know, everything's boring now. Because I feel like at Symposia, we're specifically, specifically trying to wave the, the freak flag and fly the weird banner and try to get some of the disenfranchised and otherwise marginalized discourses, give it room to grow. Because part of this problem with the mo monopolization move of different narratives is that Monopolies only work if they're allowed to work. And so some of the discourses are trying to elbow out others. And we're trying to cultivate an area for non-corporate, specifically anti-corporate, sorry, Ronan, <laughs> um, uh, views on capital, um, views on psychedelics to, to flourish. Because a lot of people have actually come to us and said, we're kind of put off by the psychedelic community and we don't really feel a place for us there. And so we're trying to um, encourage the diversification of discourse, you could say. Um, so one, just two quick things I, I wanted to point to, developing off of what Eric was saying, the corporatization specifically of psychedelics is problematic because it's rife with shell games and other confidence tricks for investors to, you know, like with the patent, um, with Compass Pathways, oftentimes very specific, uh, you know, ways of making molecules will be patented, but historically it's always been because it helps with the uptake of the of the substance into the bloodstream there's some therapeutic reason to be developing this this new approach and that was not present it was only done in the case of compass pathways all evidence points to as a way of signaling to investors 
we're, we're worth investing and we're worth um, kind of putting your, your money into. Um, and we also end up with situations now where there's kind of overnight experts. Um, and no offense again to Ron, Ron and Levy, but uh, he first came to my attention via a, a corporate marketer communications person who offered his, um, him to talk to us at Symposia as a specifically psychedelics expert, speaking to people with multiple decades of experience working in the field seemed a little bit goofy to me um, to have to use that language. And you're seeing that in just to point singly you out in particular, but you see this across the board where people are suddenly appearing with money who are kind of new to the field and they're the go-to, marketing themselves as the go-to person. The other thing I wanted to say quickly is there is a huge problem with a seemingly willful, willful ignorance around narcissism in the field and the problems with that. I was watching uh, Trump's former advisor, Anthony Scaramucci, speaking on the choice uh, um, a few days ago. It was just put on YouTube. And he had this quote that I just wanted to read quickly. We're going to have to examine how we let a masterful bully, Trump, hijack the American government and intimidate so many people. These are smart people. They know that they shouldn't be falling prey to this stuff, yet they're worried about his Twitter feed. They're worried about the pull of his base. And we're seeing still within just the psychedelic research community, serial bullies, unrepentant, unapologetic, still being platformed in roles at some conferences, including leading equity and access panels. This is a problem. If we can't deal with this, the fact that there are actual bullies who are making some voices able to speak and others not for reasons of power and a chip on their shoulder, if we can't deal with that at the research level, at the community conference level, how are we realistically going to be making impactful change on a more social systemic level? So I'll leave it at that for now. Wow, there is already so much to discuss, but I want to uh, now give the floor to Ronan. Ronan Levy is the co-founder and executive chairman of Field Trip uh, Clinics, um, and they offer uh, ketamine-based uh, therapies to treat uh, depression. And Roman before was also um, uh, co-founder of the Canadian Cannabis uh, Clinics. Um, and Ronan, please <laughs> tell us your thoughts. <laughs> Wow, there's a, there's a lot in here, and uh, I definitely don't have as many deeply philo philosophical or, or well considered thoughts as as Neshe and, and Eric. Um, you know, I think I come to the table from a different perspective. I think that's self evident. Uh, I, I fully kind of acknowledge uh, some of Neshe's critiques uh, about my personal experience, uh, but you know, I think I'm emblematic of really the opportunity and, and the positive aspects about capitalism. And to be clear, like I'm not, you know, uber capitalistic. I, I'm not a person who thinks that capitalism is a perfect solution to everything. I think it's a good solution um, for helping to make uh, psychedelic uh, therapies available on a wide scale accepted basis across a number of different um cultures, communities, professions, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not perfect, but I think every model, every approach uh, has opportune benefits and, and, and challenges. You know, they're, they're imperfect by nature. Um, but I think when you look at generally a capitalistic approach, and, and for me, capitalism, it often gets defined in a very, I think, archetypical and negative way. But to me, capitalism is just respecting everybody's agency, you know, letting people act in their own best interest or contrary to their own best interest. But that's entirely up to them. You know, we're, we're not judging people's decisions. Um, you know, we're just letting people work within the parameters of what they can do and, and hope to do. And, and certainly that leads to imbalances. And, and certainly a properly regulated capitalist system helps to address those imbalances. And, you know, certainly we're also seeing right now that uh, those balances and, and those those regulations to check it uh, don't always work. But it is a self-fixing system. We see this throughout history that when power gets skewed into the hands of too few, uh, it self-corrects. Uh, but what excites me and, and you know, why I think I'm emblematic of the potential aspects of, of the positive forces of, you know, conscious, well-considered, thoughtful capitalism is a person like me can come into a sphere, just open-minded and knowledgeable and, and curious and start to carve out a niche and, and start to work in and start to advance it and start to make this conversation, which within the psychedelic community has been, uh, you know, it, it, through the lens of um, stealing fire, like Jamie Wheel stealing fire, it's like, 
people preserve it and people get scared when it gets opened up and, and other people can access it. It seems to happen throughout history. And again, I'm just repeating the narrative of, of what Jamie wrote, but it resonated with me. And, uh, and I think there's a great opportunity here in a, in a very thoughtful way to um, bring psychedelics to the mainstream and, and, and really address, you know, I think, I think the best way personally, and this is, this is my perspective, and I'm talking all over the place because uh, this is much more deeply philosophical than I was anticipating, uh, is if you let people, if you find a way to open this up, even if it's a slightly controlled or somewhat or even severely controlled thing, the power of psychedelics is that it opens people's minds and it opens them to change perspective. Uh, and to Eric's point about like what music you're playing is already having an impression and impact on it. It's like, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the nature of human life and that's the nature of interactive social creatures. We're always going to have impacts on each other. That goes right down to, you know, um, quantum physics and, and nature. But that's okay. It's like it's it's great. We're 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 incredibly as a species adaptive. We're incredibly responsive. Uh, and you know, as as much as capitalism has created negative impacts on the world, it has also created in profoundly positive impacts as well. Um, uh, so it's it's not something I think that we need to like throw out. Uh, I think it's something that we just need to be constantly addressing and asking questions and. Um, responding to and, and evolving as circumstances dictate. Um, and that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to pull a comment from some of like the most rife capitalism, but it's like fail fast, test new things, see what works, see how it goes and, and then evolve and adapt. But by trying to make decisions in advance and I, I'm bringing my lawyer as a, as a lawyer by training hat, what I've seen is consistently uh, throughout my personal experience throughout history is when we attempt to regulate things too strictly, we do a bad job of regulating it and we create perverse consequences. And then we end up trying to regulate those consequences. And it's just a self-defeating cycle over and over. Instead of just letting things evolve and responding to them as they come, we try to protect against any potential negatives or perceived negatives before and, and often make things worse. And, and so I really just want to come into the conversation around mainstreaming it and, and, and even using the for-profit capitalistic, and I can touch on the monopolistic conversation around the compass pathways, because I think it's more nuanced and complex than is often given credit to. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the dialogue in which you have to kind of put it to, to get broader acceptance, to get medical acceptance, to get political acceptance, to get social acceptance. It's like, if we do believe that psychedelics are healing and generally a force for good, um, then I think we just got to recognize that there's existing rules and dynamics that we got to play by. Sure, you can try and do it entirely outside of the system, but you're probably going to face greater resistance. Uh, so working within the confines of the current status quo of the current consensus reality, it's not a perfect choice, but it's a good choice. Uh, and, and, and I think it's, it's worth pursuing. And I don't think we should be necessarily afraid of for-profit enterprises or patents or anything along those lines. And so we really understand the consequences of them. Um, and, you know, uh, just keep an open mind. And I think that's really what I've brought to the conversation and what everybody at Field Trip brings to the conversation is that we're, we're educated, we're thoughtful, we're open-minded and we're curious. And we want to learn. And, and I think that's the most important thing uh, that anybody can bring because too often we live in a world of expertism and a, and a fetish cult around experts who seem to know everything. And the truth is, let's recognize that experts don't know everything. They may know slightly more than the average person. That's, that's probably about it. Uh, so let's encourage people with open minds to be part of this conversation and, and evolve with it would be my perspective. I, I know I was all over the place and I apologize for it, but um, <laughs> Uh, that was kind of my, the thoughts that came to mind. It's great. Um, I think we have three very powerful interventions already. Um, Eric, I see you on mute. You want to comment? Uh, well, I, no, I just first I just want to commend Ronan for showing up here, even if you didn't quite know what you were getting yourself in for, uh, because what you're talking about, both in terms of being open and the exploratory inventive on the fly aspect of capitalism is it's some of its most appealing and creative sense. And as well as your comments about, about expertise, um, I think that's one of the main themes that happen to, to, that I'm kind of coming from is to, is to think about how the situation is changing because of the way expertise is marketed. And I'll, I'll put it this way, um, you know, from the world that I come from, the, the primary relationship is between you and the, the experience of the substance. I have a relationship with the mushroom. That's my relationship. 
And what we want to do is create a situation where people are able to come up with their own experience of that, not in a bubble, obviously there's always cultural forces, but to take away intermediaries, but provide enough of a context that people have some way to move and some you know, way to not get lost. And one of the difficulties I see with the, the whole explosion of, of psychedelic mainstreaming for these larger scalable goals is that a whole new crop of experts of professionalized clinicians with their language, with their relationships with uh, pharmaceutical companies, et cetera, et cetera. We get to, to see all that happen in a space where there was already a, a robust way that people dealt with these questions of expertise and, 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 and indeed their own kind of uh, authority. But again, I just want to say, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm not, I'm not here to like attack capitalism as some general principle. I mean, it's just, it's too much. Uh, what I'm interested in is how, given the situation, do we most encourage a rich ecology within which there are, you know, psychotherapeutic clinic, clinics like yours that people who feel comfortable with that language can go to and within which there's a decriminalization movement where people are doing things more autonomously, there's psychedelic churches, and there's the weird psychonautic people who are relying on their own expertise as, as well to go about it. So anyway, I just wanted to not, you know, not polarize uh, the situation, but I, I do wanna ask you more about the example of Compass, because to me that, that, that is a really uh, obvious clear story that we can talk about in terms of the way in which what it seems like to me, the, the, the system comes in and really kind of radically distorts the situation for its own ends, rather than for the good of the culture or the good of people who might be interested in psychedelic healing. So I'm, I'm interested in your perspective. Yeah, so, so two thoughts. First is like, I, I think you did a, a perfect example of talking about like, you know, in my mind, all the advantages of capitalism, which is like, you're right, there's all these different communities around psychedelics, even though psychedelics have been prohibited for the last 50 years. It's like letting people act according to their own interests and their own will, which to me is really the, the fundamental underlying philosophy of capitalism. Now we can debate that, but you know, from my perspective, that's what I think capitalism is, is like letting people act according to their own interests. And we already have this very robust, rich ecosystem of different perspectives of, of uh, approaches to um, psychedelics, which is great. That, that's fantastic. And we can all learn from each other. Um, and so, it, you know, just letting that happen. And, and certainly there's going to think, I think going to be a more mainstream consensus medicalized Western version of this. I think that's going to be the dominant approach to it, at least for the next 20 years, probably. Um, but I don't think that's a bad thing because I don't think that actually excludes those, those subcultures and those communities that they do get marginalized to some degree, but they've always existed. They always exist throughout society. People connect, people find, especially in this world with like the internet where people can find each other. You know, I don't, I don't think they get eliminated. I think maybe they stop being the dominant voice and, 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 you know, there's good and bad associated with it, but I do think that happens. Um, but I think, you know, to the extent that the dominant system ends up being, uh, ill-conceived, not delivering on its promise, then those other voices will start to become more mainstream again. And to the extent that the dominant system actually does a really good job of helping to help people achieve healing and develop a relationship with the mushrooms. I mean, you said it's a relationship with the mushrooms. To me, I just look at mushrooms as helping me build a better relationship with myself. So they're just a catalyst, but we can define it however you want. You know, I, I think that's just that's just how it's going to evolve. I think it's going to evolve that way anyway. And I'd, I'd point to you to a book, which I thought was, you know, I read it probably 15 years ago, but I still find it very insightful. It's a book called The Rebel Cell uh, by Andrew Potter and Joseph Heath, both professors at University of Toronto, that talks about why the, the, why uh, the counter counterculture will become consumer culture. And it's because when things are good and things work and, and people get excited by it, it spreads and it grows. And, and capitalism is a system that designed that is designed to enable that. And, and that's a good thing. Um, specifically with to the comment about compass pathways, you know, uh, the, the nature of their patent is a form of production. It doesn't exclude every other form of production of psilocybin. I mean, that's the interesting thing. When we started out, we looked at very closely at what we wanted to do and whether we wanted to get involved with psilocybin as, as a molecule. Um, 
And we decided we didn't. And the first reason was because synthesizing, chemically synthesizing psilocybin is not a terribly complex, it's a well-established thing. Uh, from a business perspective, it didn't make a lot of sense to us. And now if Compass has developed a better way to do this, good for them. And, and you know, I, I think they should have the entitlement and benefit to having some degree of monopolization if they've created something inventive. Um, but I don't think it excludes anything else. I don't ex think it excludes people from growing mushrooms. I don't think it excludes people from doing biosynthesis of psilocybin. I don't think it excludes extraction of psilocybin. It's just one particular form of it. And you know, it's probably an imbalanced um, system, but the whole idea of the patent system is that you give a temporary monopoly, and, and that's really the important word, a temporary monopoly to people who spend capital uh, to produce something new and inventive, uh, but that, that temporary monopoly runs out. And, and the, the quid pro quo of getting that monopoly is that you have to disclose all of your secrets to everybody uh, such that when the monopoly runs out, everybody can use the technology that you've invented. So um, is it an imperfect system? Yeah, but I don't think it's so unilaterally persuasive or negative as to, I, I think, I, I just, I'm not at the point where I'm convinced it's a terrible, it leads to terrible outcomes. It may, um, but I'm, I'm not convinced it's, it does right now, just given it. Now, if this was like, if, if their patent actually effectively excluded people from producing or using psilocybin, very different conversation and my perspective would be very different. But I think all their patent does is um, give them particularly a more efficient way to chemically synthesize psilocybin that makes it more useful in a purely medicalized system. Okay, that, that's fine. If they spent capital and there's something inventive in that, I'm, I'm okay with them having that because it doesn't stop everything else that I think has happened and will continue to happen within the industry. And if it does work that much better and it makes psilocybin that much cheaper and it makes these therapies much more accessible, um, good. Then I think they should earn a return on that. You know, I think that's a, that's a, that's a right balance of outcomes on it. That's kind of my high level response. And I know I touched on a lot of things that you probably both want to respond to, but, uh, you know, that, that's, yeah, good there are also questions uh, from the audience coming in, but I would like to ask, uh, Niche, if you want to respond to, uh, uh, any of, uh, of this, uh, um, well, I'll just point to, I, I put a link in the chat uh, that I recommend everyone watch. Uh, Second Thought is one of my favorite YouTube channels, and they did a really great just a week ago video called Are You Really Free Under Capitalism? Because I feel like uh, coming from a poor family um, and just hearing some of this stuff, like it makes sense that a lot of people from privileged backgrounds would have these talking points and be able to like talk amongst themselves and feel like they understand reality accurately and it's only once you're on the other side of things and you're seeing how capitalism actually doesn't work for a lot of people that holes start to appear in that narrative so um alex balser yesterday brought up the issue of class and how it's not something we talk about a lot on psychedelic conferences and i think that the diversification of class perspectives is going to be really important on pushing back against some of these like very i heard that someone said in the chat smooth talking narratives that sound great you know it's like everyone has a chance to do what they want they get to profit from what they do but in reality people some people have more ability to profit off of what they're doing than other people and other people are you know doing all kinds of free labor that then gets taken etc cetera, etc cetera. So I'll just point to that link there. I also want to just say, since I mentioned Alex, just a real quick thing. He pointed out, uh, again, um, he's been kind of uh, leading this chant for a while about getting rid of the male-female therapist dyad, which is a kind of, you know, uh, a common thing in a lot of the recent studies. And it's a, a, a very heteronormative on the one hand, but I wanted to say that it was historically instituted partially to deal with the rampant sexual abuses that were happening. And the fact that that's been done kind of quietly, like it's like, oh, we won't really address, like I was saying with the narcissists, we won't really address the extent of the problems that interpersonally people are having due to power issues, et cetera. We're just gonna kind of put in this uh, you know, approach to deal with it and, and hope that it goes away. That problem um, isn't gonna be fixed by capitalism and needs to actually be addressed by more uh, informed and thoughtful considerations of power dynamics in general in the space. Just to, on that last point, and I think it's entirely fair and I, I don't have all the background, but it's like, that's not a problem that capitalism created right by and large all of this was created outside of a capitalist system so I, I think we just need to acknowledge that like capitalism isn't a cause and it's not the cure to a lot of these these issues uh, at all um you know and, and i think all of these points are fair um you know and and so it's just at the end of the day we're, we're a society we're a large group of people uh and and we try to create rules for interpersonal dynamics and and it's just i think 
and maybe it's naive on my part, but at the end of the day, I think in any system, there's always going to be people who are on the fringes and marginalized and not reflected in the majority. Uh, and in some ways, I think that's great because as long as there's a space for them, that that's okay. And I don't think we've done a great job of creating a space for them to date, but I do think that narrative is changing very, very, you know, quite, quite more rapidly than I think I would have expected, uh, personally. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I hear your points and, and I accept them. Um, I just, I don't have, I don't have the answers, but the answer of capitalism is, is not the answer. I'm not sure is also the, the conclusion that I'd come to. I'd like to respond a little bit just to take it away yeah. from just a, a strict, let's, let's judge capitalism and talk instead about the narratives that are associated with those values. Because someone like me sitting here studying, being anthropological, 20 years and, and, and coming from this underground, it's like I get to see a really clear story of what happens when mainstream consumer capitalist, corporate, whatever you want to call it, values come in and begin to change the narrative. Because the way the narrative changes is very indicative of the values, both acknowledged and unacknowledged, that go along with it. And because narratives are absolutely central to the phenomena that we're talking about, to the phenomenology, then th these changes really have some impact. And part of the role of somebody like me who has no real power other than my mouth uh, <laughs> is to constantly remind everybody that these are just narratives and that there are consequences to them. So one of the ones that you find is that is that psychedelics, as they get mainstream, get absorbed into wellness, right? And wellness is already a sort of nebulous category that has been produced through earlier moves of mainstreaming, the mainstreaming of mindfulness, for example, selecting these practices from Western Buddhists, which selected them from Eastern traditions, transforming them, doing some studies, bringing them in, and then, whoa, lo and behold, we have this wonderful new kind of corporate tool and can help you feel better and deal with all the stress. And I, I like those things too. I'm a meditator. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm into it. But that whole kind of process produces a sort of pampering quality that we can all recognize. We can all see the way that wellness is sold through a certain kind of, of, of slick and easy hedonism that focuses on the self, focuses on the self. Many of the narratives that already existed both inside the underground and certainly in indigenous communities don't really focus on the self that way. You might have a death trip, you might discover something about your past, you, you know, there are all sorts of healing opportunities that come along. But in many different domains, there's a, there's a relationality between your experience and the world outside, particularly the world of nature, particularly the larger system within which you exist. And that, that's what I said earlier about I believe if there are universal characteristics to psychedelics, and I think it's clear that there are, one of them is this kind of larger systems view. Earlier today, we also had a, a great panel on, on nature and, and relating to nature and appreciating nature. But if you go onto the corporate websites or the, the you know, places like you guys and other things, it's all about the self and your stress and your depression and your thing, da, da, da. Those things are need to be treated. And I'm willing to give I'm not trying to hold on like this. Oh, you guys are taking it away from us, man. I'm, I'm willing for, there's a lot of suffering out there. And I'm, I'm happy that, that you guys are doing your best to try to do that. I'm not, I'm not polarizing, but I am very aware that there's consequences to those narratives that focus on the consumer in the end. That self, that individual who wants things, needs things, feels bad about themselves, is trying to adjust to an insane world when to my mind a far more systemic approach that involves nature and technology and the whole history of the human race is really at play in our contemporary moment um so that's that's sort of more one way of doing it i'm sure niche has something to say about yeah. it i just Sorry, want to respond to, to one thing on, on that just quickly which is like i i hear you and i totally see how the the narrative evolves and focuses on the self and i think you know, speaking from my personal kind of experience, which is somewhat limited in psychedelics, but very, very engrossed in like uh, consciousness, uh, reflection, therapy, reality creation is, and, and this is what really motivates me is that as much as the mainstreaming of psychedelics may make it focused on the self, 
I think the psychedelic experience is going to fundamentally change that dialogue. And so I'm actually entirely in line with your perspective and your concerns around it. My personal belief is that going through the current consensus of it actually starts to open it up the other side and makes people more open-minded to the community and the planet and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like uh, paying a little bit of a penalty up front for what I think will be a positive outcome in the end. But I think you're, you're spot on, Eric, and, and it's something to be aware of. Um, but I just don't want to be too teleological about it and say like, we've got to stop the whole thing to make sure we address it up front. Because I think actually the, the, the disease actually leads to the medicine that we kind of, I personally, and it sounds like you want to be more embraced in, in our current reality and our current society. Um, so, but I hear you and sorry, Nesha, I cut you off. Yeah, well, just uh, the, you, you see a lot of uh, like Rebel Wisdom, for example, which Eric spoke on recently. Um, they, there's a lot of this uh, ends justifies the means logic, a lot of magical thinking. Things will just kind of work out. People will feel more connected. And we at Symposia really push back against that. We think that we should do things right. My liberation come at, shouldn't come at the expense of someone else's, et cetera. We should focus more on community and collaboration instead of thought leaders and influencers. And this focus on the self and self-cultivation actually opens up the door for some of these pathological narcissistic bad actors to kind of manipulate the discourse and and get ahead and, and create you know strife for people with narcissistic abuse which is rampant and i'm actually doing a new youtube series the first episode that i did touched on um jamie wheel who i'm i'm equally uh <laughs> oppose his his ideology um so if anyone's interested i just wanted to because i saw some you know interest in the conversation our symposia is uh we have a podcast and we have a youtube channel i just wanted to flag that so because some of these themes are, are things that we've fleshed out at uh, depth there, if you would like to hear more. Do you, do you think, like, uh, you know, the risks, like, there's certainly, that's like the, the narcissistic issue is, is certainly something that, that's a risk, but do you really think the, the potential downside of it outweighs the potential upside of at least opening, even if a small degree, a whole bunch of people's minds, different perspectives? I do. And actually, a few years ago, when I spoke at Horizons, I said that the way that I kind of have memed the nature of the problem as I see it is this, this problem of vampires and zombies. You have people who are naive, well-intentioned, open, wanting to make it, you know, change and, and hearing all of this good stuff about capitalism and, and psychedelic retreats. And then you are creating a system where you're creating prime opportunities for narcissists to come forward. Oh, look, I have all these vulnerable people, all these people who will question dominant discourses who question the status quo of reality and I can insert myself and my greatness my excellence my awakenedness and use this this interpersonal dynamic now to generate narcissistic supply to feed the hole that is in my soul I mean you have these situations playing out constantly and this is why I'm going into this new narcissism kind of project because I think the fact that we are so uneducated about this very common very simple ultimately dynamic puts everyone at risk. It's like walking around with COVID without masks. Like it's like this thing is out there and we are not protecting ourselves. So it's inevitable that people are going to get hurt unless we do more education and, and question some of the more um, slick narratives around these substances. Okay. Great. Just one, uh, one little final, well, I just yeah. want to do one little twist, which is yeah, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we're, if, if remember how I talked about the ecology of it, and the ecology isn't just that there are multiple subcultures and then there's sort of like some big gorillas come in and they're gonna, not to slag gorillas, but you know, take, take over the place or whatever. But ecology is also about how we, as a broad community, interact with each other, which means like this very call and your willingness to be here and Nishay's willingness to be here and speak directly to her concerns is part of the ecology. That is the action. It's not like, Nishe is saying, this is how the world should be. And if it's not, screw it. She's saying, look, we're not going to go away. We're not going to shut up. We're going <laughs> to keep on trying to educate and throw ideas. And I don't agree with everything Symposia says. They don't agree with everything of me. I'm on rebel wisdom. They don't, you know, whatever. It doesn't, but it, there's a kind of commitment to a larger frame within which criticism, the kind of criticism we're talking about, is directed in part towards more powerful players like you. And again, I come around, I, and I, I didn't, I was sort of um, wrestling whether to say this or not, 
But there was a, another uh, psychedelic corporate uh, entity that was invited onto this panel that explicitly said they did not want to come because symposia was here. And that if we wanted to change the, the makeup of the panel, then, then they might consider it. But the language mm -hmm. they used with it that was that symposia, if symposia is part of the panel, it would not be a productive conversation. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? Productive who? It certainly would be productive for the audience members. It would certainly be productive for the people who come to this conference, for scholars, for academics, for people who are wrestling with how to do this, because we have to have the kind of conversation we're having now. But productive this for is, them. This meant, is exactly, though, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but this happens all the time where it's like, I've been in the field for 10 years. I have an Ivy League degree. I was working at a bioethics medical department. I'm seen as a liability because I raise challenging questions and I have friends. I don't agree with everyone else all the time at Symposia either, but we're people who have been kicked out of other conversations and we're kind of supporting one another to be able to, you know, David and Goliath kind of hold up this little scrappy side of things where these non-normative conversations where people say, oh you're being difficult you're being like you're making me feel bad and uncomfortable like we can have those conversations amongst ourselves and I think that I agree I, I'm really excited to speak to people who do have different perspectives but once once it's termed as oh those people have bad faith they're just out for a fight once it's like created in this us and them context then it's difficult to have these conversations and really refine the discourse around this stuff because it, it happens when like when I, I put out a series of coming out of the psychedelic closet a few years ago um, as and a lot of the really the, the the best points that I made were specific responses to challenges that I received from other people of you know oh you shouldn't be using this language you shouldn't do this you shouldn't do this how about this and it's in addressing those contradictions that I was able to further the argument that doesn't happen in an isolated bubble so I really do encourage getting past this like you know cancel culture in the sense of like seeing everything through sides and not being willing to engage with the other side um, is really important I think for making this conversation a lot more sophisticated. A hundred percent. I think, I mean, I don't know all of the dynamic. I mean, I, I had heard about like concerns about symposia being on. Listen, I, I'm, I, I hope I've demonstrated that I'm open-minded to hearing all perspectives and there's value to hearing them all. And, and like it will, like, even if I have the central paradigm through which I see the world, it will, you know, evolve it slowly, but surely, and, and it'll shift the perspective. I think though, it's like, the concern, and the, this is the concern I have, is like, if the conversation is not mature, if it's not framed in an adult, like, terminology, if it descends into being mocked or ridiculed and, and not being held in our higher bands, then I think it can be destructive. And I, I certainly know the article that features me on Symposia is not exactly... Um, you know, it, it, it is, it's critical, it's, it's mocking in tone. It's not exactly what I think would be an appropriate way to have this discussion, right? And, and I think that's, that's the really important thing is like Symposia openly says that they engage in adversarial journalism. And fortunately that comes across as very uh, honestly, very adolescent journalism and, 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 and immature approaches to critiquing people. And I don't think that's fair and I don't think that's appropriate. I think the way if we want to have these dialogues, which I think, you know, in this context right now, I think is very frank, open and mature is perfect. But too often, you know, especially in the internet where information runs rampant and there's not a whole lot of checks and balances, you get a whole lot of things where like you have the, the hoteling equilibrium where people just keep going and going out and further and further and further and further. And you can't have a a mature discussion. You can't have a thoughtful discussion because it just descends into, you know, immature adolescent punches. And um, as long as like that is, if we can agree that like that's just shouldn't be part of the discourse, then, you know, I'm 100% that I think it's great that everybody has a voice at the table. But as soon as it descends out of that, then I get it. You know, I don't know if it's the right thing to do to exclude people, but I understand the concerns at that point. Nishi, you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I actually have tried to get the <laughs> adversarial term off. I mean, the people who on the team who want that word there say that it's because it's, you know, going against power, you know, questioning power, questioning the dominant discourse. Um, in terms of the, I mean, I'm against bullying in general. So it's like if people, like, I think this larger question of people acting in bad faith or not in conversation, being able to deal with 
bad faith bullying kind of tactics and, and distinguish those from genuine attempts to understand and communicate um, is going to be important. But I think it's ridiculous, like from all of the work that I've ever done on symposia has been Ivy League PhD quality work. And so to say that, you know, this is a suspect to have me on here because of my affiliation with Symposia is a little bit goofy. I'm sorry. It's just like, you know, point to anything that I've done that has been that kind of bad faith work. And I dare you to find it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not that, I'm not that, that's not my personality. So I just feel like that itself, that, that willingness to throw me out with the bathwater in that case or an attempt to speaks to the problem in itself. And I think that finding ways to, to get it around that in the future will be, make the field stronger for all of us ultimately. Totally agree. There are a lot of questions uh, also uh, in the in the Q&A, uh, but there is actually one burning question that I would like to ask, which actually was uh, posed uh, by uh, Wade Davis earlier uh, this uh, afternoon or morning, evening, where you are, um, which is actually that when, uh, when asked about uh, the challenges of uh, mainstreaming, uh, Wade Davis actually said, well, that is actually not at all the, the, the largest challenge that we face. Um, and he actually pointed out that uh, just like uh, all uh, the, the research and culture and countercultures of the 60s and 70s were captured and uncaptured by, by the state again, he warned again uh, against this um, you know, potential danger that the Renaissance that we are witnessing now might perhaps also not last that long. And I would actually like to ask you if um, um, if you have any thoughts on that, if, if you see that as a potential challenge, what would be um, the solutions, mainstreaming, education, um, all kind of other solutions. But um, yeah, I, I was really curious to hear your, your thoughts, all three of you actually, on, uh, on this uh, uh, challenge, which is, you know, beyond mainstreaming, maybe, <laughs> yeah, or maybe as a consequence of mainstreaming, that could also be. Yeah, I mean, if I remember, you know, he was particularly talking about, look, the state could come down on this stuff, and we're just starting, yeah. and therefore, the mainstreaming is also a cover, you know, it just, it serves as a cover for the wider embrace and exploration, both in terms of you know, uh, uh, official use and going through therapeutic channels and for just a larger uh, awareness and embrace of these things. And I think that's really key. I think that the way I would, my, my little piece of it is that I think it's really important at the level that we're at it, in these conferences where we're, there's an emphasis on science and clinical research and, you know, we're, we're doing intellectual work here, is that at that level, we also have to continue to affirm countercultural and even criminal values. And what I mean by that is that that world should be encouraged to continue to go like, you know, the tech is really good for psilocybin kids. You can grow them in your own basement. Well, you might get in trouble, but hey, that's what the mushrooms want you, you know, they want you to, to, to propagate. Like that kind of maybe adolescent attitude is also one of the ways that not only do we, if, if if the mainstreaming serves as a cover for the state now, the, uh, the, the underground serves as a cover for the continued propagation of these things, even if the Renaissance goes south. So that's, it's a very interesting question, and I, I, I think he has a really good angle on it. But I think that one of the things that we shouldn't do, therefore, is to put all our eggs in the clinical mainstream basket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Ronan or, or Nishi, you, yeah. My kind of perspective is, um, I, I hear you. I, I don't know that we need to necessarily encourage the underground behavior. Um, you know, the underground behavior has survived notwithstanding like a 60 year drug war. It's not going away even uh, if it goes mainstream or if there's like a, a backlash from the States. So um, I, I don't think we necessarily need to be so proactive in trying to stamp it out by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think it can be stamped out. I, I have a lot of faith in human spirit and, and I have a lot of faith that especially around psychedelics, the, the, the passion um, for it is, is going to remain strong regardless of whatever happens uh, over the next whatever period of potential mainstreaming. Um, but I think also, I think the concerns that Neshe kind of raised around like the, the narcissistic types 
I think you, my, my sense is that you have a lot of people uh, who operate in the underground. I don't know, may, may, maybe I'm just informed by too much, uh, you know, cinematic Hollywood movies, but I think you have the risk of potentially more nefarious actors because if you have someone who is expressly willing to ignore laws uh you know it reflects something i think about uh their their personality and so that's where i start to get concerns about narcissistic personalities emerging maybe that's uninformed maybe that's naive but that's one of the things that count kind of comes up um on the broader question of like you know is is this going to be shut down is is the state is there going to be a state backlash uh, again and i know neshe doesn't agree with it but i thought jamie's point in in stealing fire was pretty apropos that i think we live in a culture now where like there's just been with the internet in particular it's it's too hard to stop things of that kind of momentum, especially if you let the data lead. I, I think this renaissance has not been a result solely of, you know, this is just the psychedelics coming out from underground. I, I think it's a result of a number of convergent trends, which I don't think you can turn back. You know, I, when people ask me about this, I think it reflects a, the need for new options when it comes to mental health care. B, I think it reflects the, the, the potency and power of the research. C, I think cannabis has done an incredible job to fundamentally um, challenge many of the mainstream ideologies around the war on drugs and probably beyond in terms of uh, trust within our, our governmental institutions. Um, and so I think all of these things are just happening at a time when, you know, and, and sort of meeting at this point. And, and so I don't think, uh, you know, barring some very extreme circumstances, you're going to be able to put those convergent trends back in a bag. Um, I think, I think it's just a little too powerful of a force. So it's not something I lose sleep over. Um, but in the same token, I, I also acknowledge that, you know, letting the underground continue to move forward and, and operate uh, within the confines, as long as they're not creating negative uh, potential impacts uh, is something that I think makes a lot of sense too. I just wanted to add um, just a, some reflection, just a lot of what I see the underground developing and you know, needing more attention, educating people to see in the underground is models, including narrative and, and literature for how not to lose the plot with some of these weird experiences. And I would really recommend Eric Davis's High Weirdness. I literally read that book on the plane to, I'm a slow reader, read it going to breaking convention. I could not put that down. I was like page turner, really recommend it. And also, um, you know, speaking of people who break the law, I mean, if, if you haven't heard uh, Leonard Picard, William Leonard Picard was recently released on compassionate, compassionate release as a result of um, COVID, but he was just spent 20 years in prison, you know, for um, conspiracy to produce LSD. And he in prison wrote The Rose of Paracelsus, which is difficult to read, but also profoundly um, useful in terms of dealing with weird states of consciousness and then coming back to community without getting trapped in narcissistic or messianic kind of weird spirals. So I think more attention to the humanities is part of this, more attention to close reading, critical thinking, and part of that will be inviting people like me who have humanities backgrounds and you know maybe aren't super pro-capitalist but have skills that are really valuable for helping people get the most out of their experiences. Great. Well, you already started answering actually one of the questions in the Q&A, which is specifically a question about how to, to you and Niche, about how to go about education if we want to keep this an open ecology, to, uh, to use uh, Eric's words. So you started mentioning already the humanities, or, but could you maybe, do you have a broader view on educational, you know, systems or, or programs? Yeah, I mean, speaking of capitalism, you know, just like I am, you know, a mom, I just lost my job or I don't have work and I'm, you know, lost all my medications and I'm really struggling right now. And it just seems like, you know, the community hasn't been able to step up and support me, you know, who has gotten all of this done, this hard work, gotten all of this stuff and, you know, degrees and, and conferences and all, et cetera. And yet I have like a lot that I could offer, you know, teaching the psychedelic literature, teaching books like Eric Davis's. And so just to me, that's like a, a, a part of it's a lot of wasted 
potential, right? Just in my individual case, I'm not, I'm just saying that because I'm just one example of the wasted potential that the current system is offering. And I think if we found ways to support people who did have these, you know, not just purely cap pro capitalistic school uh, skill sets, you know, even Eric Davis, I mean, maybe he could speak to this himself, but you know, what I loved about the book, um, High Weirdness was just the way that he went through various um, figures and, and really looked at the places where they each of them kind of got stuck in their own stories and how they found their way out and so it's like we have these bizarre experiences for example tripping experiences and then a lot of people do kind of get lost or are vulnerable to other people's narratives and and, and finding ways to learn from the past and the textual experiential records of the past in order to move forward in a in a more intentional way having learned from some of the mistakes so not just this knee-jerk oh timothy leary was a bad guy but actually like where did these people go astray and how can we learn from the past in our intentional efforts to move forward? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. I mean, I think another, another concern I have about what's happening now is the, the active forgetting of the, the counterculture. And I say that for a couple of reasons. And of course, I have vested interest because that's what interests me. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. You can kind of write me off for that, for that reason. But, I, but there, the reasons are deeper than that. One is that you know, uh, we haven't been talking about indigenous approaches at all here. In a way, that was kind of nice because it's a whole other perspective and there's a lot of other things that are raised, but it's really important to acknowledge that part of the conversation, um, as well as the decriminalization movement, which is in a way is a way to create a like a kind of a cover for underground activities to emerge and to be able to, to exist. So that's a whole other kind of dynamic that's going on. But I think one of the reasons that uh, that people are interested in psychedelics are uh, get interested in indigenous ways, whether they go and start to practice or they go down to the jungle or they just familiarize themselves or they start to use that language is because there's a sense in the West, in the modern West of, of a lack of any kind of real context, any kind of sense of continuity, any kind of sense of ancestry or of some of traditional ways. And that's always struck me as kind of weird because I'm a historian. So I'm like, what are you talking about? There's been a, a recognizable counterculture for 150 years, which means generations of people who have been exploring these things, making mistakes, doing cool things, writing great books, uh, making scenes happen, making music. There's, there's a whole bunch of lore there that's actually really valuable. And so part of what I was doing with my project is to go, A, hey, look, there's this amazing history that we're in, you know, not in danger of forgetting exactly, but a lot of the new discourse is predicated on forgetting and erasing that energy. So the, the writing off of Timothy Leary is the great example. Timothy Leary is a complex character, definitely a dark side dude in some ways, narcissist, created some problems, also a genius. I mean, a brilliant man, a brilliant writer, an incredibly lively character with lots of lots and lots of insights, a very valuable person to know about for all his flaws. But there's a kind of like, oh yeah, Leary, they blew it back then. Here we are, we're starting fresh in, the, in 1999, you know, and that kind of writing off, it actually cuts us off from precisely the kinds of information and <laughs> stories that we need in order to make a more thick and rich context for these experiences so that they're not just wellness, slick, yoga body, feeling good, whatever the thing is, or even just like a, a, a better drug, you know, a better Adderall or a better uh, uh, antidepressant, that they actually have meaning and richness. And so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like the Shea here, I'm like, hey, the humanities have a hell of a lot to contribute to this, but it's not really clear how that's going to happen. So we do our best, we write, we, you know, talk on conferences, we do too many podcasts, and, you know, we work with decrim people, we work with local, local psychedelic societies, and finally, the, uh, the kind of emergence of new sorts of churches. What's going to happen here, it's really, hard to, it's really hard to say, but it's really important to acknowledge that in America, at least, this is going to be different in, in Europe, in America, because of religious freedom, background because that there there are sort of legal mechanisms to be established as a psychedelic church that there's a very creative process that's really just beginning about how to create sophisticated intentional 
communities that have processes, including processes to deal with the narcissism that comes up in psychedelic religion. Uh, and, and whether that works or not, I'm sure there's going to be disasters. I think there's going to be some real successes that move beyond the kind of imported indigenous model. Let the indigenous do what they want to do. Let's not, let, you know, let's, let's create some of our own ways if we're not indigenous and that those might actually help bring in some of that richness and density and kind of narrative sophistication that I, I just feel is, 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 is really lacking in a lot of the contemporary discourse. Yeah, I know there is much more to say, but as you can see, time is running up. But Nishé, you really wanted to come in, so well, I just want to say my, point to make, yeah, my, my main problem with Eric's book, and I actually wrote about this in my review, but he pointed out the white maleness of these historical perspectives and said, well, white males had more kind of gumption and ability to go into these weird realms. But the women did. There were full length mass market paperback books in the you know late 50s, early 60s written by women that are just not in the historical records. So we need to change that. We need to recognize that there have been diverse perspectives this whole time talking about it and actually do that work of you know, our, doing going into the archives and, and changing this you know very limited perspective so I just wanted to add that because it, 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 it there those women's perspectives very much dealt with you know dealing with shadow stuff and I think that if we were to go back and actually acknowledge that they're there and that they have these important points to be made we can um, learn a lot along those lines so last point <laughs> Oh, all three of you made so many great points and uh, I know also from the audience comments that there is much more to talk about and I'm really happy that we have been able to start this part of the ecology uh, or, or continue it. It's, it's not. The, uh, and uh, I, I really want to thank all three of you for your contributions and also for, you know, future works and conversations. So thank you all, and I'm handing over to Joos. Yes, thank you very much, Patricia, for skillfully um, moderating this great converse, uh, conversation, guys. All three of you, thank, thank you so much. Michel, just at the end, you mentioned the diversity of perspectives. I think this conversation was an excellent example of uh, that it is indeed possible to have these diverse perspectives and still engage in a, a constructive or a productive, I don't know, what you want to call it, but at least in a, in a conversation where each of you listen to each other, present their views, and you don't necessarily need to agree. But um, this, this was personally, this was the panel that I had been most looking forward to. And I really appreciate all three of you for, for participating in this, for Patricia, for skillfully leading this conversation, which I think is really important. Eric, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts over emails. This one was one of the final panels that we put together um, and I'm really glad that it worked out so well, at least from my perspective. I thought this was a great conversation. So I, I will have to end. Uh, this is the final moment of the conference, of day two of this conference. It's 10.30 p.m. So it's bedtime. Um, it's normally bedtime for me now. My kids wake up at 7. Um, it's Saturday. It's still, it's still bedtime for me, 10.30 these days. Um, what do I want to share before leaving you? Yes, please, for those of you who haven't done so, please fill in some of our polls. This is a way for us to engage with our audience, to have a sense of what they're doing, how they're enjoying the days. Uh, don't forget to, to vote on the posters. Um, I know this, this conversation was a lot to take in. Um, for those of you who want to properly digest, we'll have an hour of uh, wave pods, uh, deep listening, a musical journey that I really, uh, that I can really recommend to people. For those who want to continue with the discussion, I hope that uh, Eric, Nishé and Ronan will be available in one of the after talks. We've posted a link in the chat. There will be a link in the Hoover description as well. So it'll be a, a smaller uh, place for you to continue the conversation. Um, all three speakers, you should have received this email, uh, this link in your email. And on that note, I would like to uh, thank you, thank the audience very much again. I look forward to tomorrow and I hope you have a good morning, rest of the day, afternoon, evening, and thank you again. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>